All right, welcome back. Let's start with this example. We have the function negative 3x squared minus 12x, and we want to determine the intervals where the given function is increasing and decreasing. And so in order to do this, what we're going to do is we're going to first find the critical values for our function, and then we're going to use those critical values to help us determine what intervals we are interested in to determine where this function is increasing and decreasing. And the critical values of a function are just the locations on the function where the slope is zero. So the first thing we have to do is take the derivative of our function, set it equal to zero, and solve for x. So we'll have f prime of x is equal to the derivative of this function. So we'll have negative 6x minus 12, right? If we use the power rule for each of these terms, we'd have negative 3 times 2 to get negative 6, and then subtract 1 from our exponent to just get x to the first power. And then derivative of negative 12x is just the coefficient, negative 12. And then if we set this equal to 0, we'll have 0 equals negative 6x minus 12, and solve for x. I'll start by adding 12 to both sides. So we'll have 12 equals negative 6x, and then I'll divide both sides by negative 6, and we'll find that x is equal to negative 2. So in this case, x equals negative 2 is going to be our only critical value. And so to help us analyze what intervals we're interested in involving this point, I'm going to draw a number line. And so this number line, you can also think of it as the x-axis. So if I label our critical value on here of negative 2, you can think of all the values in this direction as being the values of x less than negative 2, and all the values in this direction being the values of x greater than negative two. And so from that, we have two intervals that we are interested in looking at for this function. We have all the values from negative infinity to negative two, and all the values from negative two to infinity. So our two intervals are going to look like this, negative infinity to negative two, and then negative two to infinity. And so now that we have found the intervals that we are interested in determining if the function is increasing or decreasing on, we just now have to figure out whether the slope of the function throughout these intervals is positive or negative. And so what we're going to do is we're going to pick a value between negative infinity and negative two and plug it into our derivative to see if that slope value is positive or negative. And so in this case, I'm gonna pick negative three. So I'll have f prime of negative three. Again, you could pick any number you'd like that is between negative infinity and negative two. I'm just gonna pick negative three because that's the one I wanna pick, but you could certainly pick negative four or a different value that is in this interval. And if we plug negative three in, we will have negative six times negative three minus 12, and that's going to be positive 18 minus 12, which would be equal to six. So I'll just write that this is equal to six. And since that slope is positive, right, this value of six is positive, we can say that the function is increasing on this interval. If it was negative, we would say that it is decreasing, right? So whether a function is increasing or decreasing on an interval is entirely dependent on whether that slope is positive or negative through that interval. So now let's test this interval. In this case, I'm gonna pick the value of x equals zero. So I have f prime of zero. And if I plug zero into this derivative, we'll have zero times negative six, which is just zero minus 12. So that's equal to negative 12. And since that slope is negative, that means that our function is decreasing on that interval. And so now we have the answer to this problem. We found our two intervals, and we found that for our first one, from negative infinity to negative two, our function is increasing, and then from negative two to infinity, our function is decreasing. Let's look at another example. So here we're gonna be doing the same thing, except now we have g of x equals x cubed minus three x. And again, we wanna determine the intervals where the given function is increasing and decreasing. And so let's start by taking the derivative of our function and finding those critical values. So g prime of x is going to be equal to three x squared minus three, right? That's going to be the derivative of our original function if we use the power rule for each of those terms. And if we set this derivative equal to zero, we'll have three x squared minus three again, and then I'll add three to both sides. So we'll have three equals three x squared. And then if we divide both sides by three, we'll have one equals x squared. And then taking the square root of both sides will give us that x equals plus or minus one. And so in this case, we have two critical values for this function, x equals negative one and x equals positive one. And so if we draw our number line for this scenario, we would then need to label both of those points on it. So we'll have x equals negative one, and then we'll have x equals positive one. And now we can see from this number line, which again, think of it as the x-axis, we have three different intervals 
where we're going to be interested in seeing if the function is increasing or decreasing. We have all the values from negative infinity to negative 1, then all the values from negative 1 to 1, and then all the values from 1 to positive infinity. And so we have those three intervals, negative infinity to negative 1, negative 1 to 1, and then positive 1 to positive infinity. And so once again, let's test for values on our derivative to see if the slope is negative or positive for each of these intervals. And that's going to help us determine where the function is increasing and decreasing. So between negative infinity and negative 1, I'm going to pick negative 2. So we'll have f prime of negative 2. And that's going to be equal to 3 times negative 2 squared minus 3. And negative 2 squared is 4. 4 times 3 is 12. And 12 minus 3 is 9. So that means that this is equal to 9. And 9 is a positive value. So our slope is positive. And that means that our function is increasing on this interval. Then let's pick a value between negative 1 and 1. I'm going to pick 0. So we'll have f prime of 0 because that's between negative 1 and 1. So we can pick that. And if we plug that into our function, we are going to get negative 3, right? If I plug 0 into our derivative, 0 squared is 0 times 3 is 0 minus 3 is negative 3. And so this slope value is negative, which means that our function is decreasing on this interval. And then finally, we have our interval from 1 to infinity. And I'm going to choose the value of 2 to plug into our derivative. And that will give us 3 times 2 squared minus 3, which is going to be 3 times 4 minus 3, which is 12 minus 3, which is once again 9. So now we'll have 9, which is also a positive slope, which means the function is increasing on this interval. And so that is the answer to this problem. We found our three intervals and we determined whether the function was increasing or decreasing on each of them. Next we have the function f of x equals sine x and we're just looking at the x values from 0 to 2 pi for this function. And we still want to determine the intervals where the given function is increasing and decreasing. And so let's start by taking the derivative of our function and setting it equal to 0. And we know that the derivative of sine is cosine, so that's what we're going to have here. f prime of x is equal to cosine x. And if we set this equal to 0, we just have to ask ourselves what x values for cosine are going to give us 0. And remember, we're just looking at the values of x from 0 to 2 pi. Well, if you're familiar with your trig functions, you'll know that cosine is equal to 0 when x is equal to pi over 2 or 3 pi over 2. And if you're not familiar with that, I would recommend that you look up a tutorial on how to solve basic trigonometric equations. But these are going to be our two values of x where cosine is equal to 0 on this interval from 0 to 2 pi. And so if we draw a number line in this case, it's going to be a little bit different because we actually have a closed interval that we're looking at here. We're not looking at all the values for the entire function. We're just looking at it from 0 to 2 pi. So actually, we're going to label our endpoints. We'll have 0 and 2 pi, but then in between we're going to have pi over 2, which is one of our critical values, and the other critical value is 3 pi over 2. And so now we see that we have three intervals where we are going to be looking at whether this function is increasing or decreasing on. We're going to have 0 to pi over 2, right, that comes from here, and then we're going to be looking at it from pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2, that comes from this part of our number line. And then we have this part, which is 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi. And so now we can test values between these values of x on our derivative to see where our function is increasing or decreasing by looking at the sign of the slope. And so if we plug in a value between 0 and pi over 2, I'm going to pick pi over 4. So we'll have f prime of pi over 4. And we'll plug that into the cosine function. And cosine of pi over 4 is equal to the square root of 2 divided by 2. And so that is a positive value for slope, and so the function is going to be increasing on that interval. Now if you're a little confused on how I picked pi over 4 to plug in, just know that you could have picked any value between 0 and pi over 2, right? You could have picked pi over 3 or maybe pi over 6, but I decided to pick pi over 4 because I know that cosine of pi over 4 is square root of 2 over 2 out of the top of my head, so that was the easiest one for me to pick but you could have picked other values as well. And then let's pick a value between pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. And in this case, I'm just going to pick pi because 3 pi over 2 is greater than pi, but pi over 2 is less than pi. So I know that pi is going to be between these two points and it's going to be on that interval. And then if I plug pi into our derivative, cosine x, we know that cosine of pi is negative 1. And so that means that our function is decreasing on that interval. 
And then finally, let's pick a value between three pi over two and two pi. In this case, I'm just gonna pick a value that I know is close to two pi, but is greater than three pi over two. So I'm gonna go with seven pi over four, which is just pi over four less than two pi. So I know it's gonna be between our two endpoints. And if you're ever not sure that the value you're picking is between these two points, just plug three times pi divided by two into your calculator and get that decimal value. And then you can test some different values to see if it's greater than that and make sure that is also less than two pi. So you might wanna plug two pi into your calculator as well and get that decimal equivalent. So you can make sure that your value is in between those two points. Again, that's only if you really struggle with figuring out how to find these values with these different reference angles. But then if we plug seven pi over four into our derivative, which is cosine, we will get that that is equal to the square root of two over two, which is once again, a positive slope, which means our function is increasing on that interval. And so that is the end of this problem. We found our three intervals and determined that it is increasing on the first interval, decreasing on our second one, and increasing on our last interval. Let's look at another example. So next we have the function h of x is equal to x to the two thirds power minus one. And once again, we wanna determine the intervals where that function is increasing and decreasing. And so let's take the derivative of this function and then we'll move on with trying to find those critical values. So we'll have h prime of x is equal to two thirds x to the two thirds power minus one, right? That's using the power rule. And then a derivative of negative one is just zero, so I'm not gonna write that. And if we simplify this, this is gonna be equal to two thirds x to the negative one third power. And I don't really like that negative exponent, so I'm gonna move this x term to the denominator, so we will have two divided by three times x to the one third power. Now, what do you notice about this derivative? Well, for one thing, if we set it equal to zero, there is going to be no value of x that is going to make this value zero, right? You can't divide two by anything and get zero. It's just not possible. So what we actually notice here is that this function, this derivative is not continuous at the point x equals zero, right? If you plug zero into this function, you get zero in the denominator and you can't divide by zero. It's an undefined value. So if you ever see a derivative like this, where you have x in your denominator, you might wanna set your denominator equal to zero to see what's going to cause this to be zero because you're going to have a point that's not continuous for your derivative, which means that you're going to have a point where your original function is not differentiable. And if you remember, critical points are not only the points on a function where the slope is zero, but also the points on a function that are not differentiable. So what we have here is that our derivative is not continuous at x equals zero, which means our function is not differentiable at x equals zero, which means we have a critical point at x equals zero. So in this case, our critical point is x equals zero. And if we draw our number line, and then we label our critical value, we can see the two intervals that we're going to be interested in in this case. And that's gonna be all the values from negative infinity to zero, and all the values from zero to positive infinity, right? If you think of this as the x-axis, we're looking at all these negative values up to zero, and then all the positive values from zero to positive infinity. And so now let's pick some values between our intervals and test them on our derivative. So I'm gonna start with plugging in negative one. That's gonna be my choice for a value between negative infinity and zero. I think negative one's pretty good. And if I plug negative one into our derivative here, negative one to the one third power is the cubed root of negative one. And if you multiply negative one by itself three times, right? Negative one times negative one times negative one is equal to negative one. So that means the cubed root of negative one is negative one. So we're gonna have two divided by three times negative one, which means we're gonna have two divided by negative three. So we're just gonna have negative two thirds. And that is a negative slope. And so that means that our function is going to be decreasing on that interval. And if we check a value for this interval, I'm gonna pick positive one. So f prime of positive one is going to be equal to two divided by three times one to the one third power, and one to the one third power is just going to be one. So three times one is three. So then we're just gonna have two thirds. And that is a positive slope, which means that our function is increasing on that interval. And so that would be the final answer to this problem. We found the two intervals of interest for this function, and we found that for our first interval, the function's decreasing, and then for our second interval, it's increasing. Let's look at one more final example. So this time we have the function f of x is equal to the absolute value of x minus two plus three. And once again, we are interested in determining those intervals where that function is increasing and decreasing. 
So now what do we know about absolute value functions? Because this is gonna be a little bit different than what we've worked with so far. Because normally we would take the derivative of this function and set it equal to zero to find our critical values, but we're typically not used to taking derivatives of absolute value functions. We can certainly do it, but many people are not familiar with that and it's actually not really necessary in this case. We don't really need to take the derivative here to find our critical value. Because remember, critical values, as we saw in our last example, are also at points where our function is not differentiable. So if you think about this function, we know that absolute value functions are always gonna have a point where the function's not differentiable because it's going to have a sharp point. And so if you're not sure where that point of non-differentiability is, just set what is inside your absolute value bars equal to zero, so in this case, x minus two equals zero. And if we solve for x, it's going to tell us where our point of non-differentiability is, which in this case is going to be at x equals two. And so now we know that our critical point for this function is at x equals two. And so this is going to be our only critical value for this function. Because if you remember, an absolute value function is shaped like a V, right? Absolute value functions are shaped in this way where they have one point that's really sharp, but then the rest of the function is going this way and this way. And so there's not going to be another critical point anywhere. And so if we draw our number line in this case, we're just gonna have that one point at X equals two. And so we're going to have two intervals that we're interested in here. We're gonna have all the X values from negative infinity to two, and then from two to infinity. But now how do we test the values for these intervals if we don't have the derivative? Well, this is where we're actually gonna have to think about the graph of the function itself. But fortunately, absolute value functions are some of the easiest functions to graph because all we have to do is draw our coordinate system here and label our axes. And we know that this function is gonna have that point of non-differentiability at x equals two. So if we label that right here, then we know that our function is going to look like this. Now, it's actually going to be three units up on the y-axis, so I can actually adjust for that. So we'll say that we'll have it about here, and then we could draw our function, and it would look something like that, and it would continue on forever. And so if we look at this graph of the function, we can see that the slope is negative up until this point and positive after that point at x equals two. So we really don't need the derivative in this case. We can just visually see that on this side of x equals two, we have a negative slope. And on the other side of x equals two, we have a positive slope. So we would say that our function is decreasing because it has a negative slope on this interval. And then we would say it is increasing on our other interval because it has a positive slope. And just be careful, if there was a negative sign in front of this absolute value, right, if we had a negative right here, then our graph would actually be pointing in the opposite direction. So it would look like this instead, rather than pointing upwards, it would be pointing downwards. And in that case, that would change which interval is increasing or decreasing, right? We would be increasing on our first interval and then decreasing on the second. So just be aware of that if you see an absolute value function, that if there's a negative in front of it, when you graph it, you need to make sure to flip it. All right, and so that was the last example for this video. Hopefully you found these examples to be helpful. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. But if you don't have any questions, that's all I have for now. So I will see you next time.